Okay, we are in Hebrews chapter 3. Last week we uh, focused on verse number 1. Verse number 1 is not stop at verse number 1 with the, with the thought, but there was a lot that was packed into there. And uh, we're going to move on with uh, what this writer of Hebrews... <laughs> I had someone uh, tell me earlier this week is uh, I was writing an article for something and I uh, had a, you know I was having a friend of mine proofread it and uh, you know and I mentioned the Hebrews writer and he said that's like his biggest pet peeve and we see that a lot in articles and manuscripts and everything where some you know because we don't know the writer of Hebrews we just uh, you know see that we just sometimes assume that oh this is the Hebrews writer and or the Hebrew writer I rather. And he said, we don't know if he was Hebrew. We don't, if we don't know who he was. And, uh, and it was just something that he pointed out. It wasn't critical or anything, but it was just uh, interesting. That, uh, and we really don't. We don't know the writer, you know, who it was. We have a lot of speculation. But um, whoever it was, this writer of Hebrews, uh, is getting, you know, his, his emphasis here is to get people to understand, um, as we've been looking at this, uh, to not, you know, these Jews that have converted to Christianity to not fall back into Judaism and not go that, you know, they're the uh, wrong direction. And uh, last week, as we uh, looked at verse 1, he says, therefore, holy brethren, and he, you know, he identifies them as holy brethren. We looked at what, you know, this word holy means uh, when, you know, when we see someone referred to this. That was a, I mean, that's a term of endearment that is very, exclusive and special to those who are in Christ. He says, these holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. And that's interesting because, you know, obviously they would have been very attuned to what that high priest was in the Jewish system. And so he's making this, you know, this uh, break from that. He's, you know, he's making this comparison right here. He says, Consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession. We knew what the high priest was back, you know, what you used to be, what you used to follow. But he says, consider the high priest of our confession today, which is Christ Jesus. And so as these people were, you know, that were struggling with going back and this, this writer of Hebrews was trying to get them to understand, hey, this is a much better system and it's something that we need much more than what we did before, you know, he was trying to, you know, these terms that would, of which they would have been very familiar, he's saying, now look at it. Now look how good this is. And then he goes on, this, you know, this high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who, verse 2, was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in his house. And so we see is, you know, this is a look at how Christ, you know, taking this uh, subordinate role to the Father was, you know, in being uh, sanctioned it, you know, to come down and do what he did here. He says he was faithful to him who appointed him. But he's, then he go, says he, he turns his attention to Moses, and that's what he's going to do for the next couple of verses right here. He says, just as Moses was also faithful to all his, Christ's house. And so we see this, you know, this, uh, the, the attention right here that's being laid to, you know, to, to emphasize the you know, the uh, relationship, the house that uh, he's talking about right here in all of his house. And so for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. I'm just going to read it through six and then we'll break this down. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant being God's, Christ's house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And so we see this comparison right here of, of Moses' house, which is what they would have been a part of before, and Christ's house, which is what they're a part of now, and he's trying to get them to understand you know, just uh, the difference in it. There was, you know, w you know when, the, when the Jews were called and the law was given and they were going, you know, they were amenable to those laws, were they flawed laws? I mean, we know we have laws that now that are better than what those laws were, but were those laws at that time flawed? 
Is that what he was saying? No. There was a purpose to those laws, weren't there? There was a, you know, there was a point to what those laws were, and it was to get them to understand that, you know, as, as the transition is made, just, you know, the principles certainly apply. We're not under the same kinds of laws that they were back then, but certainly the principle is to apply. But, you know, God gave the laws. We know that the laws were not going to be flawed. God doesn't give a flawed law. He gave those laws exactly the way he intended them to be, and they served the way that they were supposed to serve for those Jewish people. But now comes this new one that's, you know, much better. And so he makes this comparison starting in verse 2 uh, to Moses. He says he was faithful to him who appointed him also when Moses was faithful in all his house. But were there, there were those that didn't obey or follow Moses, weren't there? <laughs> Just as there's not, you know, there are people today, we have this new law in effect, but just because laws are in effect, does it mean that people are just automatically going to follow them? We know people don't follow their laws. That's how Jim was able to stay, you know, in a, he had a job for all those years, right? Because people didn't follow the law. Just because they are in place doesn't mean that, you know, everyone's just going to, you know, do what, they, do what they say. And that's what he's getting them to understand. Moses Brings down, you know, he, he, he introduces this law, he ushers in this law, or many laws, but they still had trouble back then. And that's the same way that these, you know, these people that he's talking to right here are being lured back into Judaism compares to the Israelites being tempted to return to Egypt. And remember what they kept saying to Moses? You know, they go through and Moses, you know, he, he presents the manna and he get, you know, gives them the water, but they were... At first, when they didn't get it right away, what happened? What was their mindset? What was their attitude? What did they do? They were grumbling, weren't they? To the point where they said, you know what? We had a lot better back in Egypt. At least we got fed. They said, why didn't we do things? You know, and Moses just, you know, he kept correcting them. And sometimes he was harsh. He had to be. They knew that their life in Egypt, how difficult that was. And when they, you know, when they were murmuring all those times, 10 different times they murmured to Moses, saying, why didn't, you know, we're, we, you know, we ought to be back in Egypt. We, ought, we need to be here. But they gave us this. They gave us this. And Moses kept just correcting them with it. And so this, you know, these people being lured back into Judaism compares to the Israelites being tempted to return to Egypt. They could, you know, they could keep saying, but was, it, was that the case? Was it better back in Egypt for them? No, what kind of a life did they live back there? They were slaves, right? And being slaves, and it wasn't just, you know, these weren't just employees of the Pharaoh. They were slaves to the Pharaoh. It was a hard life, and they kept, you know, and... and, and Seeing the description that we do in the Old Testament when we read of the life that they led was nowhere that anyone would have ever wanted to be. <laughs> and yet they kept saying, well, you know, hey, this was, it. and you look at what that, you know, what these people were, and then you look at what at us today, because it's the same kind of application that we can make. He's saying these, you know, he says, you didn't have it better under Judaism. Why would you ever go back to Judaism the way that it was? Because number one, they didn't have the promise, not with Judaism, not with all those laws. They could keep those laws, but they never had the promise. We see that in, you know, all the way at the end of Hebrews chapter 11. And he had to get them to understand that. You did not have it better the way that you were. And then we look at it today. Whether it's a religion that we have come out of, whether it's the world that we have come out of, a lot of people, you know, they're drawn back to that, aren't they? Well, it was a lot easier when I was back here. Or at least I could do this when I was back. But was it really a better life? That life provided no hope. It might have been, you know, temporary fix. But it wasn't ever, ever going to be able to give you what a life in Christ is going to give you. It's going to be difficult. It can be the way that the Jews, when they came, you know, when they went through the wilderness, was going to be difficult, but there was never a time, ever, when what they needed was not provided. They just knew, you know, they just knew what they wanted. And isn't that like, you know, it's like us today, isn't it? 
I can want something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I need it. And we always, you know, we always, we have a list of what we want, don't we? Little children have lists of what they want, right? I had, you know, I had a, I had a Christmas list for my son three months ago. <laughs> it started, and it keeps building. And so, but we don't, you know, it doesn't stop with kids. We have every, you know, we, we keep saying, I want this, and I want this, and this is the kind of life that I want, and I want to do this, and what happens if we don't get it? Same reaction a lot of the time, right? We get disappointed and we get frustrated because it's just not what I want. But there's a difference between that and what I need. And there, what they needed was to be sustained in the wilderness. And God provided it for them. They were just looking short term. They were looking, you know, carnally as well. But then this, you know, and so when this hits... And this transition takes place, and this new law comes to into effect. He says, you follow this high priest who is the Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him also as Moses was faithful in all his house. Both, you know, both Moses and, and Christ were faithful, weren't they? We know Moses was faithful. He wasn't sinlessly perfect. We know that he did things that were in violation of what God had said. That's the whole reason he never even got to see Canaan. But while Moses was faithful in God's house, Christ was faithful as God's house. And that's what these people had to understand, that they could be in God's house. And it wasn't a physical house. It wasn't going to be the kind of house that Moses said. Remember, you know, I'm, I'm, the article I was referring to is uh, I've been writing one for something on uh, the tabernacle and how this, there is a better tabernacle. Anyone ever do a any uh, research or read anything about or study the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Do you remember what that, what was the tabernacle for? Why, 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 I mean, why was that built? It was a house for God? Okay. What else? For worship? For sacrifice? Okay. How was it displayed? What was outside of the tabernacle? Courtyard. Okay, what was in the courtyard? You remember? It was surrounded by tents on all sides, not being able to get into that tabernacle except for one entrance, was it? And that entrance was, you know, in the front of it, but there were certain things that had to take place before someone even got into that tabernacle. Now, there were priests and there were different people that could go in and, in and out of there, but before they even went into that tabernacle, what had to take place? The what? Okay. There was a laver in the front of the tabernacle. What did they have to do in that laver? Wash themselves, right? Cleanse themselves. Otherwise, they wouldn't be worthy to go in there. Okay? We start reading a lot of types and shadows, and Hebrews is chock full of the types and shadows that we're able to read about. That's why they, you know, and we see that a lot because, and they had to understand that because here was the Hebrew people, these Jews, knowing everything that they had physically, but knowing, you know, with what the anti-type would be or the shadow of what those types were, now it's all spiritual. Now it's much more than that. While it might involve some physical uh, elements, the nature of it is spiritual rather than physical. Back then, they had to sacrifice animals in a physical way, didn't they? And that's exactly what the tabernacle was. They had the, you know, there's the altar that the high priest would use, and he would slaughter an animal on that altar once a year. What would he do with the blood? Takes it into the tabernacle all the way to the most holy place because it was separated into a holy place and most holy place. What was in the most holy place? Ark of the Covenant. What did that signify? Or what was Ark for? The house God, that's a mercy seat right there. And he had to take it in and sprinkle the blood on, that, on the ark. But in the, whole, in the holy place, when you start looking at this and what the comparison was, in Hebrews later on, we're going to look a lot more in depth than what, right now, but uh, it's an amazing thing. Inside we had what? What was in the holy place inside the tabernacle? Do you remember? Once you go inside of it, Okay, there's a table of incense. 
the candle, like, yep, the golden candlestick, or the, not the candle, the golden candlestick, the golden lampstand that held the candles. Table of showbread. So you've got the, well, the seraphim was on the, on the uh, ark, and that you know, was built on the ark. So you've got the table of showbread. What does that, in, what does that signify? <laughs> when you look at the comparison of what this was, it's the church with what we're looking at right here. It was the type of what the church is, table of showbread. We see the Lord's Supper being made, and we'll see this comparison later on. You've got the candlestick, or the lampstand, okay? What do, you know, what is, what do candles do? <laughs> it's light, isn't it? It lit up the place. And when you look at the comparison, it, you know, it, it talks about uh, that this is the presence of God, that God is you know, lighting up the place. In fact, when you take that and couple it with what uh, Revelation chapter 2 says, he says, unless you repent, I'm going to remove what? <laughs> I'm going to remove the lampstand. In other words, unless you repent of your, you know, in your lives, I'm not going to be present <laughs> I'm going to remove myself. And then we have this, uh, the incense. And when you look at what incense is, and, you know, and they describe it, uh, Exodus talks a great deal about this. He talks about all these different things. Incense, what, what's the purpose of incense? Why do we light incense, or why would they light incense? It's what? It's the aroma, Right. We don't just light it to light it. I mean, it's not going to start a fire or anything, but people light it because it smells good, right? It's an aroma. And when you look at that table of incense, prayer is described as that being that aroma that's lifting up to God. And so all of these things that they're building with this tabernacle is a type of what the church would be. And so we see that right here that you know, Moses is faithful in all his house, meaning he was faithful the way that he kept the law and the things that they did with this tabernacle. And that's how, how it had to be. It could not be any other way. You couldn't enter the tabernacle from any other direction. It had, there was a process to going in. And once you're inside, there were specific things. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant had things inside of that that were representative of what, you know, what these people would be. Who knows what was inside the Ark? Ten, okay, the law was in there. What else? Staff, the staff of Aaron, representing the priesthood, because that was the priesthood of Aaron right there. Now we have a better priesthood, right? And manna, which was given to them to sustain them, but now that in Christ, God says, I'm the bread, and I am, you know, that I'm the bread of life. No more do we just need that physical. Remember, it's all spiritual in nature when it's settling all of what the type was. And the staff of Aaron, better, you know, better priesthood. We're going to be sustained now with Christ. The law, we have this new law that is in effect. And in between the holy place and the most holy place was the curtain. What happened at Christ's death? <laughs> curtain ripped in, was ripped, right? Indicating that those who are in the church, those who are in the, t in the holy place, now had access to the most holy place, which is heaven. It's an amazing thing. You can preach the gospel, of, you can preach the plan of salvation from the Old Testament when you look at what the tabernacle was representing right there, which what, you know, with what it was. This is what, you know, the tabernacle, looking from the old to the new, and he was getting them to understand all of this. Remember, this is, you know, this is the first time these people are reading this, this letter right here. And it was a, it was a compelling red letter saying, look, this is, you know, just as Christ came, you know, was obedient and came down and did what he needed to do, Moses was obedient to the Christ. Christ was, you know, faithful as God's house. And they had to understand that this was a greater house than they ever would have built under the Old Testament system. And he says, verse 3, For this one, the Christ, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So these people were very, you know, they knew, they, I mean, they esteemed Moses, didn't they? Remember, Moses, you know, Moses was long gone by now. But these Jews knew who he was, and they held him high. <laughs> 
because of the law that he gave, a law that they were under for many, many, many years. In fact, you know, 1,400 years, that law was in effect. And they kept it, and they liked keeping it, and they were good at keeping it. And now this new law, one that was going to be completely different, he says, this one who has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, the one that you held up so high, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Who is the head of this new house? Jesus. What was the new house that he was referring to? It's the church, right? Church is only as good as its founder. It's only as good as its builder. You have a church that was built by man. It's only as good as whoever that man was that put it, or woman. There were churches built by women. That's it. They're only as reliable as the one who makes them. And he's saying right here that this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. And so he emphasized that Moses was a great man. He was worthy of glory, but he's nothing compared to who the Christ is. And he goes on, verse 4, for every house is built by someone, but he who builds the who built all things is God. And so you start to see the contrast right here between this house that Moses built or this, you know, the, all, all of these different laws that they had to keep and what God was expecting them to keep now. I mean, you think of just how, you know, when you look at what this, you know, what Moses was involved with in building with the tabernacle, and then you see what, you know, what the church is right now. And we have a description of the tabernacle. Could they just, you know, when they built that, you know, what they had back then, could they have done it anyway? Was it man's instruction to build this thing? No. Who was it? God. And he gave them the, the schematics to do it. You, were, you know, you go all the way back to Exodus, and it talks about what the dimensions were going to be, the material that he was, they were supposed to use, the measurements that were supposed to be, how it was to be painted, all the fixtures that were to go on it. And, and you know, when you look at the, uh, the uh, ark that was to go inside, and you, even, you, know, you look at the mercy seat itself. Like Sharon said, you know, you've got the cherubims on there. It couldn't be done another way. That ark had to be built exactly to God's specifications. There was gold that was to be laid. There is, you know, for the, for the tabernacle, different things had to be constructed. And you're able to see back in the Old Testament how each thing was even to be built. In fact, what they did is they said, okay, there's going to be this tabernacle. This is going to be where people go in. This is going to be for worship. And this is where the high priest, Aaron being the first high priest, this is where he's going to go in to the most holy place, and no one else is going to have, be able to have access to that most holy place except for that high priest. Now, they can, like I said, they can go in and out of that temple if they do what was, you know, what was authorized for them to do, to wash in that labor, and then to go in and to fulfill whatever you know, responsibilities that they had. But they had to do that first. And so once they had the, you know, the tabernacle spe specified, then they had to make every single thing that was going in that tabernacle to God's instruction as well. That table of showbread had specific instructions. And you're able to see that in the Old Testament, that this is how it was to be built. And it went on and on and on of telling them, this is how you, I want you to put it together. This is, how, this is the color I want it to be. These are the, you know, these is, you, know you, want, you put this on it. And this is going to be its function. That altar of incense, that's how this is, going to, this is going to be. And they had all of these specific things that they had to do to make sure that that holy place was really going to be holy. Man couldn't just do that. Every single thing had to be done according to what God gave them. And that is one of the most compelling things things that we could ever take out of this when we start reading that comparing it to what Hebrew the the writer of Hebrews wanted these people to know these Jews because when we look at the church and when he's when he's making this comparison you know this contrast and how God has counted more glory than Moses 
It wasn't just God that was counted more glory than Moses. It's that God's house is going to be counted as more glory than the house that Moses built, this tabernacle. They weren't going to have to have that tabernacle anymore. You know, Christ was a son. Building a house requires a builder, don't they? doesn't it? House isn't just going to put itself together. And what happens if, you know, if you were to just go and try to build a house one day, and you didn't have, you know, you didn't have an architect, you didn't have any plans, you didn't have any writings or renderings or drawings of that, and you just said, you know what, I'm just going to go get a bunch of wood and metal pieces and panels and everything. How stable do you think that house would be? <laughs> How together and precise do you think that house would be? Could any of us just go and do I couldn't. I have trouble when I have instructions. We, right. <laughs> it's amazing to me that, you know, some people, I mean, you know, and some just still don't think it through with the way that homes are put together. You know, it's interesting to me. I was, I was like, when, when I lived in Southern California, if you've ever driven up, um, I think Laurel Canyon or Mulholland Drive or whatever, you'll see these millions and millions and millions of dollar homes that are up on these hills. And you know what holds them up? One single block of wood. <laughs> One single beam that holds that house from toppling over on that hill. That's it. The balcony comes over. They look really lavish. Guess what happens when a mudslide hits? <laughs> It has destroyed so many homes, and then all of a sudden it doesn't, you know, the value on that home. You know, when you're that homeowner, you know how much it's worth because you're paying for all the damages, but then, you know, you drive by, that home is not looking so good anymore. It's not stable. You know, we hear, you know, we sing, we sing that song about the wise man build his house upon the rock, right? And the sand. That, that house could look as good as it could be, but if it was built not on the sand, and does not have that foundation, doesn't matter. That's what he's getting them to understand. The tabernacle had to be built to God's specifications, and then you take that and compare it to what the church would be, God's house, and we see that in verse 4 and following. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast, there's that condition again, if we hold fast the, condi the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. The house to which Moses built was inferior to the one that Christ built. It's better. And you look at the specifications for the church. Could anyone just build a church? There are a lot of churches out there, right? But to be the one had to be what God had specified. Ellis. That's just clear. When you look at the Old Testament, how that was put together, and Moses talks about it, there being a pattern for it. They, you know, there was a pattern to what they had to do. And you look at that and make the comparison to the church today. Is there a pattern for it? Absolutely. Like Ellis saying, you know, later on, this, there is a, you know, there's some people that don't believe there's a pattern. <laughs> but when we look at what, you know, what was going on then, why it was being done. And the only reason why all of that stuff was even being done in the Old Testament is to let us understand God's mind and his purpose, his, you know, the, of what he wanted for when his church was around. He, remember, he always had his church in, in, his, in mind. That was always 
going to happen. And we're able to see that, that pattern in the old, and we're able to see the pattern of the new, and the church has certain things that it has to meet, doesn't it, for it, in order for it to be the church. Number one, it has to be the church that we see, you know, that we read about in Acts chapter 2. It had to be done on Pentecost. If there's another church that came along after that Pentecost, we know it's not the true church. Why? It didn't follow the pattern. If there was another church that was established, up, you know, was somewhere else besides Jerusalem, don't follow it because that's not, you know, that's not what, that's not what God wanted. We see another church with some big flashy name or any kind of name that's up there that we cannot identify, that I cannot go to the scriptures in the New Testament and say, hey, you know what? That church is in here. <laughs> look at that sign up on the, you know, look at that sign on the side of the building. That'll be your first indication. Doesn't mean that it's going to, you know, that everything else is going to fit. But if you can't find that church in the New Testament, and we see all of this, you know, Missionary Baptist Church here and Presbyterian and all of these different kinds of churches. But if that is not in there, that's, you know, that's the first sign that it's not fitting the pattern of what God wanted. He has specifications for his one house, his church, like there was for the tabernacle back then. And it's better. Annetta? Absolutely. Aren't we thankful for that? <laughs> that's a great point. I'm going to end it with that point because I think that's a great one, that we now can petition Christ directly. We don't need a high priest. We can go straight to the high priest now. Because he is the lawgiver. Appreciate everyone's attention and your comments.